Good morning and welcome to Stony Creek United Methodist Church. My name is Pastor Michael and I'm happy that you are joining us today, whether you're out in our parking lot or visit, uh, joining us via Facebook Live or listening to this later on our podcast or call-in number. For, our, uh, for those of you joining us via our parking lot, could we get a couple car honks so we know you can hear us okay? Awesome. A um, couple quick announcements. Um, Next Sunday, we will be returning to in-person worship in the sanctuary. Now, there's a couple uh, stipulations to that, that so we can keep everyone healthy and safe. Um, you will have to wear a mask, and you will have to be vaccinated for in-person worship. Um, you can, we'll continue to have broadcasting into the parking lot. Um, at least that's the plan as of right now. Um, but we'll also continue to broadcast over Facebook Live um, and have things, again, on the podcast, on the call number. So you have multiple options based on uh, how you feel in terms of uh, being around other people um, and vaccination status and all of that. But to be inside in the sanctuary, again, we are going to require that you wear a mask and that you are vaccinated. Um, so we are very excited about that. We're excited to be able to see one another. We're also going to continue to practice social distancing while in the sanctuary. So we ask that households sit together um, and that people kind of respect that six foot uh, distance between one another as best we can. Um, and also, I know this is gonna be the hard part, uh, but refrain from uh, hugging um, and shaking hands with uh, one another. Uh, we can do air fist bumps and stuff like that, but um, with the new variants and the numbers continuing to rise, especially in Michigan, we want to make sure that we're doing everything we can to keep everyone uh, safe and healthy. So um, if you have questions on that, I would invite you to uh, contact myself or one of the members of the board. Um, but this was a long process in us trying to figure out the best way to move forward with all of this. A lot of prayer and discernment and keeping uh, on top of the latest information that we have from our health agencies. So this was not something that was done lightly or uh, haphazardly. This was something that was very intentional in every step of the process. Um, I think that's all I have. Do you have anything? Oh, she does. Get ready, folks. The good stuff's coming. Good morning, Stony Creekers. It's Barb Makarowicz being your liturgist this morning. Before, before I turn to a lighter note, the past week has been stressful. I'd like to ask that we all take a moment to pray for the families, for the community of Oxford, any of us that have ever worked in education I think sometimes you fear for your life when you go in the door. It's a totally different world out there than when we were in school. So please pray for the children and the families of Oxford. Thank you. Real quick on that note, um, there's going to be a prayer, prayer vigil um, outside the Lincoln High School main entrance tomorrow at 7 p.m. Uh, they're asking for the Lincoln community, parents, students, staff, and friends to come together to remember Oxford High School students and also pray for our own Lincoln community and that we commit to do better and not fall victim to any of the copycat threats. Um, and that we all can stand together and be our brother's keeper. Um, there's a Facebook event, uh, I'll inevitably seven o'clock at the high school uh, tomorrow night. Okay, so let's take a deep breath and go back. A few announcements. I was fortunate enough to have lunch with Jenny Davis Brown this week, and she said to tell everybody hello, and she's doing well. She's getting herself in trouble over there, staying very active. Um, she is not driving anymore. Um, but I can tell you she's got enough things going on that it's still, that's what I aspire to be when I grow up. Um, 
prayers for her son, Dan Davis. We know that he's uh, had cancer and um, he's continuing to have some struggles. And her son-in-law, Michael, that was married to Sandy, is his heart is continuing to weaken. So prayers for Michael as well. Uh, and prayers for Sandy Scalise and her family. Her sister has been in the hospital. Then, okay, if I could get down on my knees without it looking ugly uh, and then get back up without that even being more ugly, uh, I would ask if anybody's available on Friday from 2 until 4, if you can even come for a half hour, an hour, whatever, we're going to be in the fellowship hall with children uh, decorating Christmas cookies, making Christmas ornaments, making a candy cane felt mouse, a few other things. So uh, let's just say it's going to be labor intensive and we're going to need some adult supervision. And probably for the adults more than anybody. And we hope that you're enjoying Advent in a Bag. I know Connor and Molly have been doing theirs each night and they've been having a great time. And then I will admit that I am a Hallmark Channel fanatic. Love this time of the year. And if any of you get Women's Day, Women's Day, Candace Cameron Bure, one of the frequent stars, is um, very Christian and she writes an article. And I'd just like to read a little snippet before we enter into our singing. Her verse of the month for December, and it's from the New English translation. For a child has been born to us, a son has been given to us. He shoulders responsibilities and is called extraordinary, strategist, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. It is in the quiet that we can be filled with the joy of Jesus. This year, let us take a little time for yourself and Jesus and remember to be the Mary so that you, you can bring the Mary to others. And as we move on, let's do our call to worship. We'll read responsively. God with us, Emmanuel comes to give us our own holy family here with the body of christ this day rejoice and be glad amen our first hymn is going to be O come all ye faithful
now let us join together in our opening prayer. Eternal God of power and grace, who comes to us in surprising ways, in angel appearances, in defeat of enemies, and in resurrection from the dead. Show us the face of Emmanuel in our time. Bring us from fear to awe, we pray, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Okay, now we are going to do the Advent meditation. First, we have a time of reflection. Joseph shows us a profound trust in today's gospel. God does not appear to Joseph when he is wide awake and at prayer. There is no assurance of a burning bush or parting clouds on the mountaintop. There is only a dream. Can we trust dreams? Do we not quickly dismiss dreams if we can even recall them a few moments after we awake? The dream, however, was enough for Joseph. He had been asking many questions. What should I do about Mary? What does the law demand? What does my heart tell me? The dream answered these big questions. And our response? When has God communicated with you through a dream? Did you trust that the dream came from God? A prayer we lift. O oh God of dreams and visions, help me to remain open to your leading in whatever form you give it. Amen. And lighting the candle. The candles on this wreath have their own special significance. The four candles represent the four weeks of Advent, and one candle is lit each Sunday. Three of the candles are purple, because the color violet is a liturgical color that signifies a time of prayer, penance, and sacrifice. The second candle, also purple, represents faith. It is called the Bethlehem candle, as a reminder of Mary and Joseph's journey to Bethlehem. And now let us join in singing the Advent song. join together in reading the affirmation of faith. We believe that God has come to us, that God brought us into being, that this God gave us a breath and purpose, that we have been blessed to be a blessing to others, that we have fallen short of this commandment, but that God has nevertheless loved us despite our brokenness. We believe that God is coming to us, that God is not happy to leave us alone, that this God will come to us as a particular human being, that God will be made known to us in flesh and bone like ours, that Mary will soon give birth and Joseph will soon clap his hands in joy, that Jesus Christ will be born and our salvation made complete. We believe that God will come to us, that God will have the final word, and that word will be good, that this God will give us the presence of the Spirit to continue our work, that we are called to be disciples to all the corners of the earth, 
that the day is coming when tears and pain will be no more and all will gather at the table to sing an endless and perfect Alleluia. All that we have is the Lord's. All that we may become and receive is in God's hands. For the sake of the joy that is ours, when our bonds grow deep with others, let us give generously for the well-being of the world. Would you please join me in our doxology? God, you bless us with many gifts. You retrieve us from despair and fear. You visit us with surprising proclamations, and you intend for us good things. We thank you for your steadfast love, for sending signs of assurance, and for the gift of faith. 
Use our gifts to bring comfort and justice to those in need, reforming the ways of our world for the sake of new life. Amen. We will continue with hymn number 220, Angels from the Realms of Glory. be having our youth moment this morning as two of our youth uh, were uh, potentially exposed to COVID at school, so they are um, testing and, and staying away from potentially infecting others. They do not have COVID, but just trying to be safe, so uh, we will resume with our youth moment next week, because at that point they will be um, out of any uh, danger with all of that. If you would join me in an attitude of prayer. As we come to the festival of Jesus' birth, let us pray that we hear God's word clearly and receive the faith God gives, saying, O oh God who is with us, hear our prayer. Holy One, who astonishes us with surprising gifts, we pray for your church and for people of faith in every language and belief that your wisdom will show us our common life and that all people may rejoice in what you create. O oh God, who is with us, hear our prayer. Giver of the stars and planets, creator of rivers and oceans and creatures large and small, we pray for wisdom as we live on and with your earth. Evoke in us awe for your goodness in these familiar surroundings, our hills and valleys, forests and deserts, that the powers you have placed here to move through soil and air will remind us always of your bounty and your love. O oh God, who is with us, hear our prayer. Power above all powers, we pray for the leaders of governments in every nation, that they may have wisdom to choose what serves the common good. O oh God, who is with us, hear our prayer. Lover of all creation, we pray for all of those we too easily forget, those of your children who are poor or homeless or in prison, those who are sick or lonely or frightened, all who hunger for faith and hope. Care for them that they may be strengthened by the joy in your healing. O oh God who is with us, hear our prayer. Holy One in whose community we thrive, we pray for those with whom we share our daily lives, 
our families, friends, and neighbors, those with whom we work and play, those whose names we do not know who provide for us, that we may all be renewed in courage and nurtured in hope. O oh God, who is with us, hear our prayer. Sustainer of your people, we give you thanks for members of the body of Christ in every age and every place who, by their witness, brings us here today. Come to us in Christ, O God, that we who live in this world by faith may see that faith confirmed in the world to come. Through the risen one who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And if you would join me in our prayer for illumination. As your Holy Spirit spoke to Mary, the mother of our Lord, speak to us now through your word, that by hearing we too may receive faith and be strengthened to do your will. Amen. Our first scripture reading for this morning comes from Genesis chapter 21, verses 14 through 20. The, uh, the gist of this reading is that God keeps his promises, even though people make mistakes, and God's ultimate promise is grace, peace, godliness, and eternal life through Jesus Christ. As I was reading this, uh, on different times as I've started studying the Bible more, uh, there's these words that just kind of throw me for a loop, and I go, oh, I wonder what they really mean by that. And in this scripture, they refer to bowshot. So I thought, oh, I'll look it up. And it means the distance to which a bow can send an arrow. Well, it wasn't that simple. So usually, let the stones throw away. Yeah, stones throw away. You know, usually you come up with some really whew, off the wall explanation. And I'm like, oh, well, that was simple. So let us find out about this scripture. So Abraham rose early in the morning and took bread and a skin of water and gave it to Hagar, putting it on her shoulder along with the child and sent her away. And she departed and wandered about in the wilderness of Beersheba. When the water in the skin was gone, she cast the child under one of the bushes. Then she went and sat down opposite him a good way off, about the distance of a bowshot. For she said, do not let me look on the death of the child. And as she sat opposite him, she lifted up her voice and wept. And God heard the voice of the boy, and the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What troubles you, Hagar? Do not be afraid, for God has heard the voice of the boy where he is. Come, lift up the boy and hold him fast with your hand, for I will make a great nation of him. Then God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water. She went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink. God was with the boy, and he grew up. He lived in the wilderness, and he became an expert with the bow. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. And now we are going to sing Once in Royal David's City.
Our second scripture reading this morning comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. This section of text is uh, given the header, the birth of Jesus the Messiah. Now the birth of Jesus the Messiah took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Her husband Joseph, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to dismiss her quietly. But just when he had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins." All this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph awoke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took her as his wife, but had no marital relations with her until she had borne a son, and he named him Jesus. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. If you would join me again in an attitude of prayer. God of the impossible and the miracles, you are all powerful and have no limits. Your love and grace knows no bounds, and you continue to share them with us, regardless of our shortfalls and sins. Help us to build strong faiths. Faiths that are unshakable and have a foundation in your mercy, love, and grace. Help us to have a trusting faith like Joseph when you bring us good news, no matter how amazing or unfathomable it may seem. And now may the words of my mouth, the meditations of our hearts together in this place, be pleasing in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, good morning to you all once again. Today, as I mentioned at the beginning of our service, is the second Sunday in Advent. Advent is the season of anticipation and hope as we look forward towards the birth of our Savior, our loving Savior, Jesus Christ. As we enter our second week of our sermon series, Angels with a Message, I just wanted to remind everyone of some of what we talked about last week and also get anyone who may have missed last week caught up with with where we are. Last week was a message of hope, and we followed the story of Zechariah and Elizabeth as they are told about the son that they would have. Their soon-to-be son, John the Baptist, was going to be looked upon with favor by the Lord. He was going to turn the people back to God. He was going to help the people prepare themselves for the coming of the Messiah It was a message of hope for many people and in many ways and still is today. And of course, given the title of our series, it was a message brought by an angel, specifically mentioned in our reading to be the angel Gabriel. Angels are the ones who open one of the critical doorways for us into the vision of Advent. The scriptures surrounding the time that we label as Advent are actually the largest concentration of angels anywhere in Scripture. And these angels, they bring different messages to various peoples, along with their actions of rebuking, encouraging, guiding, protecting, advising, and worshiping. So from the rigid priest, also known as Zachariah, to a baffled young virgin, Mary, whom we will see soon, to a strict fiancé, 
one carpenter named Joseph, who we're going to focus on today, to common shepherds out in the field at night and several others, they were all met with messages by angels. The impact on each of these people was profoundly life-changing in, in so many different ways. We must again ask ourselves if each of these people could be led to see the incarnation through the angel's eyes, are we then also not invited to do the same? You know, people will often talk about needing to just have enough faith to get through a tough situation or maybe to believe enough that God will deliver the desired outcome to a situation that they face and have no control or influence in. And I've witnessed and heard these things mostly around uh, medical issues when someone seems to be facing a certain end to their own life or the life of a loved one. And, and they are told to, or in their or on their own, tell themselves to work hard to have faith and believe that everything will work out for the best. And this is often, if not always, easier said than done, especially when it involves the life of someone we love. If you yourself or someone you know has ever gone through the agony of watching someone you love fight the battle against cancer or another life-threatening illness, you know exactly what I mean. Yes, we, we want to fully put our faith in the doctors and the medical professionals and, of course, God to help heal the ones we love. But it can be very challenging to simply sit back and feel helpless to do anything for someone who means so much to us and hold such an important place in our lives and in our hearts. There are other places in life, though, we, we may find a struggle, maybe to hold tightly to and trust our faith in something. As someone who grew up just outside the city of Chicago, I had just about given up any faith that the Cubs would win a World Series in my lifetime or ever again. And yet, it happened. And the world didn't end or anything. Most of us were pretty sure that was going to be the sign of the apocalypse, to be honest. No earthquake, no catastrophic storm, and, and laugh all you want, but I know the Lions fans who are listening can understand this feeling. When we look at Zachariah and Elizabeth's story from last week, we see this issue of faith in Zachariah's initial response to the angel Gabriel that cost him his ability to speak until John was born. And while I find it kind of funny that, yes, Zachariah is punished, if you will, or whatever you want to call it, that he's not able to speak, that label doesn't seem to follow him where Thomas, later on in the Gospels, gets the label of doubting Thomas for all eternity. The truth is, though, I can't say I blame Zechariah, given the circumstances and realities of his world at that time. How old he and Elizabeth were that they had tried before but never been able to have a child, and so on. But nonetheless, Zechariah had a moment of loss or struggle in his faith to believe what Gabriel was telling him about having a child. What about in our reading from Matthew's Gospel for today? Here we have a foretelling of the birth of Jesus, the long-awaited Messiah and Savior of God's people. And this is just one of the foretellings, uh, foretelling narratives that we find in Scripture. This one, though, is, of course, directed to Joseph. And the announcement itself carries all kinds of themes and miracles and much more. I want to go back and dig into what we find there. Our, our story starts with the readers, including us, learning that Jesus' mother, or mother-to-be, Mary, she was engaged to this man named Joseph. 
So far, so good. But then, scandal. Because we read that before they lived together, which meant everything you imagine that to mean, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. So for Joseph, and almost anyone else who didn't know the full story quite yet, it would appear that either Mary had been unfaithful to him or potentially sexually assaulted and raped. Back in these times and in this culture, it was a really, 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 really big deal that the bride was still a virgin when a couple married. And this reality that she was pregnant may have affected Joseph in, in several different ways. First, he may have been heartbroken. We don't know really much of anything about the relationship between Mary and Joseph and if he maybe had romantic feelings for her. Finding out she was pregnant might have felt like a betrayal to Joseph. Although not every marriage back then had much of anything to do with romantic love, this marriage could have been primarily a business transaction, if you will, as horrible as that sounds, and Joseph may have just felt like he was getting scammed. The truth is, we know practically nothing about Joseph or his feelings in this situation. All we are really told is that he was a righteous man, and because of that, he did not want to publicly disgrace Mary, but he wouldn't said end the engagement quietly or privately. Again, we don't know if this was because he loved her enough that he didn't want to ruin her life or put her life at risk, if it was simply ending a business deal that did not prove to be worth it anymore or something else. We get no real insight into how Joseph feels about anything, which does make sense in that the gospel writers may have never asked or had anyone share that with them. Joseph may have never shared what his feelings were with anyone. After the little bit we do get of Jesus' birth and childhood, Joseph is really never mentioned again. He just kind of drops off the radar. Now that could be, because, could be because he did not play a significant or large role in the focus of Jesus' ministry, or he may have passed away by the time Jesus began his ministry. Again, we just, we just don't know. But I do think we can infer some things about Joseph, his character, his faith, and the like from what we do find in this section of Scripture. We are told that he is a righteous man, and he does not want to publicly humiliate or harm Mary or her reputation. I think then, at minimum, it would be safe to say that Joseph was, if nothing else, a kind and grace-giving person. But then the real fun starts, because we learn that an angel of the Lord appears to him in a dream. Now, in this scripture passage, we are not told the angel's name. I spent the time to check many resources and writings of other biblical scholars, and while there are some assumptions made by some people, the truth is we do not have any definite evidence of which angel visited him in his dream. I will say that one of the assumptions that several biblical scholars agree on is that it very well could have been Gabriel, especially given how many other times Gabriel is specifically mentioned in this time frame, sharing essentially the same message with other people. Others argue, though, that if it was in fact Gabriel, why would we have not been told that as we are told when it is Gabriel in other places, which then is evidence that in this case it couldn't have been Gabriel. And if you followed that, A plus for you. Either way, an angel of the Lord comes to Joseph in a dream and instructs him not to end the engagement, to not divorce Mary, and instead care for her, raise Jesus, and so on. And Joseph does just that. 
Verse 24 and 25 say, When Joseph awoke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took her as his wife, but had no marital relations with her until she had borne a son, and he named him Jesus. Now again, we get no insight on how Joseph is feeling about any of this, just simply that he complies with the instructions given to him. But to do even that... I truly believe it says a lot about Joseph's faith and the faith the angel may have brought to him. To be able to simply let go of the concerns and the issues that his society would raise in a situation where a husband-to-be found out that his wife-to-be was already pregnant and instead continue on as if nothing was amiss, that required faith. And it required faith in what that angel said and all of what would come to fruition. We have to remember that God's people had been waiting what seemed like an eternity for this promised Messiah. And now all of a sudden, the Messiah is coming and it's coming to Joseph. Joseph wasn't a ruler. Joseph wasn't some government official or high priest or someone else with a high rank and status in his community and in the world around him. He was a carpenter. And while there's great debate about whether or not Joseph and his family were poor or middle class or wherever we would put them in the hierarchy— he still didn't hold any real place of high authority or privilege in his community and country. Why would the Messiah come to be born from the woman he was to marry? Why not enter into the world with a family of power, a king or a governor or a military leader or or someone of great fame and fortune and influence? Why choose Joseph and Mary? Was it simply because Joseph was a righteous man and God knew that he would listen to the angel and that he would follow those instructions and he would care for Mary and Jesus and be a father and a husband and a provider? Was it simply because Joseph came from the line of David and that was an important part of Jesus' identity and legitimacy as the Messiah and Savior? Or maybe all the above. Well, this one goes into that we just don't know for sure column. But I do think that Joseph's faith and trust in God had to have played a role. Joseph had free will, just like all of us do. He could have reacted in countless different ways. But he followed what God asked. He did his part in this greater plan. And I can only say that his faith had to have been a huge part of that. And this message in a dream from this unnamed angel, it's a message of faith to all of us still today. It is a message of faith in the coming of the Messiah and Savior. It is a message of faith that God does love the world and is going to save the world through God's only Son. It is an example of what can happen when we have faith, when we hold on to dear life and we see God's hands at work in the world. We are told that Joseph was a righteous man, but I also believe he was a faithful one too. Amen. If you would please turn to pages 15 and 16 in your hymnals or on the uh, continuing in the bulletin for those of you with the printed versions as we prepare to celebrate Holy Communion. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. 
Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through your prophets, who looked for the day when justice shall roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. When nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ, whom you sent in the fullness of time to be a light to the nations. You scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts and have mercy on those who fear you from generation to generation. You put down the mighty from their thrones and exalt those of low degree. You fill the hungry with good things and the rich you send empty away. <coughs> your own son came among us as a servant to be Emmanuel, your presence with us. He humbled himself in obedience to your will and freely accepted death on a cross. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through your prophets. Who looked for that day when justice shall roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. <coughs> Excuse me. Let's back that up a minute. As we proclaim the mystery of faith, Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and juice. Make them, be for the make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and your Holy Church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. Amen. And now, the confidence of children of God, let us pray the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one loaf. The bread which we break is a sharing in the body of Christ. The cup over which we give thanks is a sharing in the blood of Christ. In the United Methodist Church, we practice open communion, and what that means is that normally when we're in here and we're using the table, that table it doesn't belong to me, to this church, to this denomination. 
That table belongs to Jesus Christ and he alone, and he has invited everyone to come and partake. You don't need to be a member of this church or a United Methodist or a member of any other denomination for that matter. It doesn't matter if you're baptized or unbaptized, what your race, gender, mental or physical ability may be. It doesn't matter if you're rich or poor, young or old. All those ways we try and divide ourselves and the boxes that we cram ourselves and others into, he doesn't see that. Jesus sees us all as beloved children of God, equal and worthy of grace and love. All that he asks is in this moment, in this holy sacrament, that you come with an open heart. Now this morning we are again uh, bringing our own Jesus, if you will, and there are two ways you can choose to receive the elements. You can do intinction, which is a big word that means you take your bread, you dip it in the juice, and then you receive the elements together. Or you can take the bread and then drink the juice. They are both acceptable. Neither one is better or worse than the other. Brothers and sisters, friends, I invite you now, the body of Christ and the blood of Christ given and shed for you and for all the world, please now receive your elements. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning will be number 237, Sing We Now of Christmas. And I apologize, it appears that the last line in the refrain uh, did not make it into the bulletin. Um, that last line... Uh, the refrain should be, sing we know, sing we Noel, the king is born Noel. And then the part you're missing is, sing we now of Christmas, sing we now Noel. God, do not be afraid. Listen to the word of the Lord who promises to be with us in every age. Spread this word to those who live without hope. Live this word as people who know God with us, Emmanuel. 
Now let the face of God shine upon you to bless you and save you from all doubt and danger through Jesus Christ now and always. Amen. Have a blessed week.